foods, including workers at Shop Easy here in Dauphin. Dauphin. Union officials speculate it could based on newspaper ads. West Fair Place look issues include job security and the chance for senior employees to clock in. in hand account of what the Reform Party is all about. A federal reform MP toured the area yesterday, stopping by Dauphin late yesterday afternoon. I attended the meeting to find out what the reform message is. The VP for Liscard Marquette and was touring with another reformer. Dale Brown is the candidate from Russell. Hepner is one of 52 reformers in Ottawa, but he is confident that in the next election, more reform candidates like Brown will be calling Ottawa home. He spoke to a small gathering about the Reform Party in Ottawa, then about issues which are important to him as the agriculture critic. I've always promoted agriculture as being the basic issue in government. If we don't support agriculture, I always say the rest of the economy will sooner or later collapse. So that has been my agenda to make sure that farmers get represented, that we address some of the problems, uh, the problems of transportation, the problems of marketing, and also the problems of labor. Hepner told those gathered that he recently introduced a reform bill in the House of Commons that would declare grain handling an essential service, which would mean farmers would no longer have to fight with labor unions and have service disrupted at harvest time. When questions started coming from the audience, inevitably the issue of the reform's position on the Canadian Wheat Board was brought up. And, uh, and I think the Reform Party has a very, very solid uh, policy on that. We say we have to have a Canadian wheat board, but it has to be democratized so that people again get control of the wheat board because now it's run by politicians, bureaucrats, and you don't really know what's going on in the wheat board. Hepner feels the only way to make the wheat board accountable and effective again is to put it in the hands of the farmers by having elected commissioners. The party knows they have to sell themselves as they are relatively unknown, but Hepner says they are working on it because their election campaign is already underway for the 1997 election. While Halloween was relatively quiet here in Dauphin, it was quite a different scene in Russell. Many residents are angry over the abuse of their generosity in handing out treats. Most of them don't mind giving away candy to children from the town, but citizens feel it is unfair to bring bus and van loads in from out of town. Many of them say they had as many as 200 kids come to their door and notice that the drivers of the vehicles also appeared at the door. Several people say they saw kids get back into their cars and change costumes and then return to the house they had just already visited and asked for more candy. Vandals made their presence known as well. A house, a sign and cars on a used car lot were spray painted as well as uh, obscenities on a new fence. Sergeant Bruce Petrie says if residents are fed up, they should call him to volunteer to patrol the streets next year. And judging from the weather forecast, winter is just around the corner. But if you like to find the positive angle on everything negative, just think about next summer's Country Fest. Organizers are saying the next festival will be even better than last summer's with bigger name acts than ever before. If you want to guarantee your spot, tickets go on sale next Friday. And the names of acts already booked will also be released at that time. A judge rebuked the president of the Manitoba Métis Federation for bringing unfounded charges against three people who served as an interim board for the organization. Among other allegations, President Billy Joe de la Ronde had accused former Governor General Edward Schreier and Menno Weeb of the Mennonite Central Committee of authorizing the removal and shredding of Federation records. Madam Justice Ruth Crindle said yesterday the honesty and integrity of the two who served on the board last year is above reproach. She said they were subject to personal attacks, direct and indirect, on their integrity and honesty, none of which had any merit whatsoever. The LaRonde could not be reached for comment. The first-degree murder trial of Saskatchewan farmer Robert Latimer has heard just how lethal carbon monoxide poisoning can be. Murray McComb is a toxicology expert with the RCMP forensic lab in Regina. He told the court a sample of Tracy Latimer's blood was 80% saturated with carbon monoxide. 
The Crown alleges Latimer killed his 12-year-old daughter by venting the exhaust from a truck into the cab. Tracy Latimer had suffered from cerebral palsy since birth. Malcolm says if the exhaust of a pickup truck was vented into the cab, a person would be unconscious within 15 minutes and dead within half an hour. And now we'll turn to take a look at the weather in and around the Parkland area. The temperatures right now across the area, Mafeking is at 3 degrees Celsius, Swan River 2, St. Rose 6, McCreary is at 7, Gilbert Plains 6, as well as Grandview. Roblin is at 4 degrees Celsius, Russell 6, Yorkton and Wasagaming are at 7, and Winnipegosis is at 5. In Dauphin right now, we have cloudy skies. Our temperature is sitting at around 8 degrees Celsius. And the winds are from the south at 13 kilometers per hour. The barometer is at 102, and that's rising. And the humidity is sitting at 36%. Taking a look now at the forecast for the southern parkland area. Tonight, increasing clouds. The winds will be from the south at 30 kilometers per hour. And the temperature should reach a low of around minus 2. For tomorrow, mainly cloudy with a 30% chance of showers. The winds will be from the south at 30 and gusting at times to 50 kilometers per hour. The temperature should reach a high of around 8 degrees and the low for tomorrow night will be minus 2. And for Friday, mainly cloudy with a high of 6. And now the forecast for the northern parkland area, including Winnipegosis. Tonight, increasing cloudiness. The winds will increase to southeast at 30 overnight with a low of minus 4. For tomorrow, cloudy with a 60% chance of showers in the afternoon and evening. And that will be mixed at time with snow in the Flin Flon region. The winds will be from the south at 30 with gusts to 50 with a high of plus 4. And the low for tomorrow night will be minus 5. And Friday, cloudy with a 60% chance of wet snow with a high of 0. That's it for now. Trevor's in with a look at the sports after this. Has your truck just seen its last harvest? Then drive down to Foreman Ford and ask one of the sales staff to show you our huge truck inventory. We have our best selection of new and used trucks in stock right now. Choose from over 70 trucks, vans and explorers in two and four wheel drives. Take advantage of year-end savings on 94 models or get a great deal on the new 95s arriving daily. And remember, selected models carry factory rebates of up to $1,500. Experience the power, durability and dependability of a Ford truck from Foreman Ford in Dauphin. Welcome back, everyone. We only have time to tell you about the Dauphin Kings. The Kings were back at it last night as they played host to the visiting Nipah natives. They had to put forth a solid game against the Allard Division leaders, as well as trying to show their critics that they could keep up with some of the best in the league. After the game, Dauphin came out smiling on all accounts as we check out the highlights from last night. Even after a 25-minute delay to start the game, the Kings were pumped up and ready to take on the first-place natives. Lars Molgaard gets physical and takes the body on this Nipua player, and Eric Pavin gets some quick work in net early on in the contest. The Kings strike first at the 9.04 mark. Ian Monroe spots Steve Hogue on the point. Hogue's blast gets through to Mike Jelensik, who deflects a shot past native goaltender Dwayne Hoey for the 1-0 lead. The natives shrug that off and answer back exactly one minute later. Jason Glover takes the initial shot on Pateman. Mike Bernick picks up the rebound, and after two whacks at it, he ties up the game just like that. Bernick almost gives Nipua the lead on this shot, but Pateman just gets a piece of it, and the puck misses the far post. It was a good game by the Kings offense. They got their chances and cashed in on them. Joey Beaudry finds Mulgaard crossing the blue line. Lars bolts around the Nipua defense, puts the shaken bake on Hoey, and gives the Kings a 2-1 lead. Just 10 seconds later, Lars almost does it again. He gets a clean break on goal, but the same move doesn't have the same result this time. In the second frame, the Kings keep on pressing. Brent Wishart feeds Daryl Luke, who goes in all alone, but Hoey is there to close the door on that chance. Nipua finally gets a break on an unfortunate mishap in the Kings' end. The natives catch Dauphin alone with one man back. Jason Glover passes off to Bernick in the slot. Glover gets the puck right back, and his shot is accidentally deflected in by Molgard. Game's tied at two. Lars shakes it off and redeems himself five minutes later with his second goal of the game. Trevor Kozak lofts a pass to him over the Nipua defense. Molgard coasts into the native zone and picks the five ball on Hoey to get back the one goal advantage. Dauphin's not finished yet. The Kings go up by two towards the end of the second. Mulgard gains the blue line and finds Lane Makira streaking to the net. He pops one over the sprawling tender. Kings are up 4-2 after two. In the third, the Natives try to get themselves back into the game by getting that message across to Mike Jelensik, but looking to take the body, left great scoring chances for Dauphin once again. Wishard goes in all alone, but is foiled by the glove of Hoey. The natives close the gap a little as Dale Isfeld lets one go from the circle. The shot makes it through traffic and over Pateman's stick hand to bring the natives within one. 
But with just over a minute left, the Kings stick a fork in Nipawa with this nifty passing play between Jelensik and Monroe, with Lee Erickson finishing it off by scoring on a low shot along the ice. And that's how she ended. Final score, Kings 5, Nipawa 3. Following the game, Coach Bourbonnet said the team finally put a solid 60 minutes of hockey together, and they showed a lot of character by scoring early and keeping the lead late in the game. It's very important that uh, when you have a two or one goal lead in the third period and you're able to hold a team, uh, those kind of things give your club a lot of confidence. So, uh, you know, able to hold the lead, uh, the lead uh, late in the third period uh, throughout the room, uh, you know, you'll be able to feel the confidence in there and practice tomorrow. If, you're, uh, if you attended the game last night, I'm sure you'd have to agree that seeing the Kings uh, take control of the game once again and scoring the big goals was a sight for sore eyes. It was obvious that the big stars last night were Lars Molgaard with his two goals and one an assist, as well as the combo of Monroe, Erickson, and Jelensik. That line also contributed by collecting four points for the win. But that's not all who contributed in the win. One of the Kings who had a stand-up game last night was Brent Wishart. The first-year King didn't have any points on the night, but was in front of the Nipawa net all game and had his share of chances. So for all his hard work in the Nipawa game, number 15, Brent Wishart, is my pick for the Atkinson's Unsung Hero. Slip into comfort and style at Atkinson Sporting Goods in Swan River. We carry all types of sports apparel, including Apex winter jackets, licensed caps and clothing by Apex, Nutmeg, Starter, Ravens, and more, as well as a full line of replica NHL jerseys by CCM. Treat your feet to a pair of quality shoes by Nike or Reebok, and remember, look to Atkinson's for Road Warrior Road Hockey Equipment, plus a complete selection of new and used hockey equipment. Atkinson Sporting Goods in Swan River is your answer to all your sports needs. In regards to how the Kings offense produced in the past few games, they really exploded last night, getting opportunity after opportunity to put the puck in the net. Brent Wishart was one of those Kings who had the big scoring chances. Although held pointless, the first-year King was one of the spark plugs on offense last night, always grinding to the net and creating scoring opportunities for his teammates. Wishart realizes his scoring chances are coming quite often, and he also knows he'll continue to get the ice time until his hard work pays off. I've been going good so far. Just As you say, the points just haven't been there, but... Dan's been reassuring me that if I keep working hard, they'll start to come, so hopefully it's soon. I know what I'm going to get when I, when I put Brett Wishart on the ice. Uh, I'm going to get 100% effort. He's going to go straight ahead with the puck. He's going to finish his checks, and he's going to work hard. He's a kid that's uh, going to continually improve, and he's got the, the type of attitude that he just loves to play. And uh, when you love to play the game and you love to be on the ice, uh, it really shows. We're all out of time. Stay tuned for the Parkland Family Farm Past and Future Series. Good night. Has your truck just seen its last harvest? Then drive down to Foreman Ford and ask one of the sales staff to show you our huge truck inventory. We have our best selection of new and used trucks in stock right now. Choose from over 70 trucks, vans and explorers in two and four wheel drives. Take advantage of year-end savings on 94 models or get a great deal on the new 95s arriving daily. And remember, selected models carry factory rebates of up to $1,500. Experience the power, durability and dependability of a Ford truck from Foreman Ford in Dauphin. Parkland Family Farms Past and Future. Today's show truly is a family show because two years ago this young couple made in-laws of the two families featured today. First we will visit the groom's family, the Eisners from Minnetonis. The first Eisner was in the area before the turn of the century. Lawrence's grandfather must have liked the area because he made a permanent move years later. Yeah, more or less actually uh, just at that time there were things were getting tough over there with the uh, countries fighting and that. and. Uh, they, my uh, my dad's dad actually came here in 1912 to look things over here. He was here earlier, and uh, he came here for a year to kind of scout out, and then he worked actually in the states for a year, and then went back to the old country here, and uh, then brought his family family over here in 27. Lawrence says it was the farmland that attracted his predecessors to live in the area. Well, they always said it was the land of milk and honey here, and in uh, one uh, book here, and uh, they they figured there's lots of opportunity here for uh, for people. To, I guess they weren't used to this kind of size of uh, the country here and uh, the opportunities they had here. And uh, down there everything was more confined, I guess. And uh, they must like what they saw here when they came here because a lot of people at that time came over here at about that time they immigrated here. Actually, it started. There was a lot of immigrants came about the same time, 27, 28, 29 there in, the, in that time. Lawrence's father-in-law, Glenn Bertram, remembers first meeting Lawrence's family. 
Uh, I can well remember when Lawrence's people dropped in in September of 27. That was my dad. My dad's family. Yeah. There was five families came. But I'm leaving uh, my life. Uh, but uh, uh, our place was the first place they uh, came to. Like the, uh, just a mile away they settled and... Uh, Lawrence's father worked on other farms in the area before starting out on his own in about 1935. Oh, they scrubbed. I think they had uh, some poor land and he started with a few cows in the, the middle land and uh, just kept building from there, actually. He uh, started up there. They were pretty poor when he started out. And uh, we were always mixed farmers. He always kept cattle. He always, when he actually, uh, they lived north of here, actually. When, they first, when he first started, they lived north and they moved uh, just two miles south of here actually and that's where actually the family all grew up here just two miles south here big house along the highway here Lawrence was actively involved with farming when he was young and his sons have kept up that tradition actually when we were younger we were uh, always had uh, we quite a few cattle around we were in mixed and we were in the forage clubs and that we used to show cattle and this and that in different uh, fair we used to brand fair show calves there when we were younger and uh, we were always in the forage clubs and uh, we always kept cattle and that's what we got now too uh, I got four boys uh, now and uh, Three of them are uh, starting on their own, and the other guy is uh, coming home too. He's playing hockey in Winkler, and he's coming back to farm probably. And uh, we run about 160 cows right now here, and we're getting some more. It's building up the herds here for the boys here. So our main cattle operation is actually about 14 miles uh, east of here, and uh, the boys are all. Uh, my dad gave me a quarter actually there when I started uh, when I got married, or before I got married, and we kind of expanded from there ever since in that area there because the land's a bit uh, poor land and it's good for livestock. So. Uh, We've been expanding there ever since, actually. But besides farming, Lawrence is busy in another business. Well, actually, actually, I mean, it's something else. I'm a, an auctioneer, actually. That's my main business, actually. I, I don't know what's the better business, the auctioneer or the farming, but uh, we're doing both, actually. We do a lot of farm sales and uh, farm equipment consignment sales. And uh, I go to Regina once a month and sell Great Plains uh, auction there, a big farm equipment auction. And go into Alberta next week to do a sale, and we do quite a bit of auctioning, actually. Clint lives nearby with his wife Lisa on their own farm. He says he likes the laid-back atmosphere of the country and knowing his neighbors. But he keeps busy by holding down three jobs. I like auctioning. I enjoy it. It's actually quite a bit of fun rather than work. It, but the farming end of it, I'm expanding my own and trying to get my herd built up to that point where, like, our, my job is government-funded, so they keep pulling out money all the time, so that could end any time. You never know. So I'm trying to get my farm built up, and like Dad says, I got a wife teaching, so that helps and pays for some groceries. But um, I'd like to get my farm built up to where I could just concentrate on my livestock a little bit and the auctioning and take her from there. Another son, Ryan, is starting to add to the cattle he already owns. He says he has always helped out around the farm, and farming is what he wants to do. The other son, living at home, Chris, owns some land and is busy building a shelter for calving. Eventually, he hopes to get some more barns built for his cattle and then build a home. The fourth son, Chad, is playing hockey in Winkler, but Lawrence says he will probably come home to the farm. And raising four lively boys is no easy task, and Mom Glennies says, among other things, she has had to play referee many times. It takes a lot of patience, a lot of good sense of humor, for sure. <laughs> Especially when they bring their frogs home from the river and throw at you. Working closely with family could be nerve-wracking for some, but for Lawrence and his sons, it is not a problem. Well, it's kind of nice to have them around here, and uh, they help me, and I help them. And uh, Clinton, he's, he uh, helps me auction. He's, he went to auction school here, and he's, uh, he helps with the auctions and uh, does quite a bit of auction himself, too, here. And uh, it's kind of nice to have them around here. We, uh, maybe we could use it. Like, uh, actually, there's not quite enough money in the, on the, in the farming end of, end of it for them to... Uh, but uh, getting got a wife teaching, so it helps him out there, and uh, maybe the younger guys have to get a side job too. When they, when LP comes in, maybe on the side. But uh, whether well, there's enough money just in the farming, and then I can't afford to get them all. Uh, I wish we win a lottery so I could give them all some money, but uh, right now it's just to get them all started. They got to once they get them started, they got to do it on their own actually. So they all got their start pretty well, and uh, if they make it, they make it. A good sense of humor is apparent in all the Eisners, as is the parental desire for the children to succeed. Lawrence says he will help his kids get started, and his attitude is, if they want to get ahead, they will get ahead.
For crowd-pleasing pizza, come to Irving's Steakhouse and Lounge. It all begins with a crunchy crust, their own special sauce, and lots of matzo cheese. Select your own toppings, and they'll do the rest. Whether you dine in or take advantage of their full takeout service, Irving's never keep hungry customers waiting. Remember, group discounts are available, and with each two-topping large pizza sold in the 94-95 season, one dollar will be donated to the Parkland Recreational Complex. It's your kind of place. Irving Steakhouse and Lounge in Dauphin. Screw it. Glue it. Plane it. Drill it. Hook it. Cut it. When you're ready to build it, improve it, or fix it, there's one place that has everything you need to get the job done. Try it. Buy it. Nail it. Oh! We're your hardware store, and we're here to help. Shop your local Dewitt Center's Northern Specialties in Swan River or McMunn and Yates Dewitt Center nearest you. We're overstocked at Dollar's Furniture Warehouse, 101 Main Street North in Dauphin. For a limited time, we'll pay the GST and PST on all new and used furniture in our store. That's no GST and no PST on sofas, love seats, occasional tables, recliners, swivel rockers, kitchen suites, bedroom suites, box springs, and mattresses. Everything is GST and PST free right here and right now at Dollar's Furniture Warehouse. Open Monday to Saturday, 9 to 6, and Fridays, 9 to 9 in downtown Dauphin. This is a common sight around the Hamilton home every summer. Richard and Linda Hamilton of Ochre River have one of the biggest silage operations in the region. Along with 1,200 acres in cropland and 100 cows, their extensive farm keeps them busy nearly every day of the year. And Richard says the industry has been good to him and his family. Cattle lately has been a good, uh, a good industry, yes. Uh, over the years, from the time my grandfather uh, started, of course, it, it has grown. My, uh, Dad bought originally, as Linda mentioned, the home farm back and uh, then bought extra pieces of land as they came up. And in the early 60s, when I started to become involved, uh, I bought other land as well, like this uh, three quarters I bought from my uncle at that time. And uh, we picked up uh, other land as long. Not uh, in the recent, in the, probably in the last, we haven't bought any more land in the last 20 years. So our, most of our expansion was in the 60s. And we were fortunate, uh, it's actually just fate that uh, in those years land was cheap and it appreciated very much in value uh, in the 60s and 70s. And uh, if you were buying land in the 80s, it was a tough time. But we were able to uh, do all right because our land had been purchased at a lower price and uh, we weren't involved in the high interest rates, high price land. So we fared not too b badly there, and, and cattle has always been a big part of our business, and it's, it has its ups and downs as well as grain farming or anything else, but it always seems to uh, manage to pull you through. Things were not always this prosperous. When the first Hamilton family settled in the area, they did it against some huge odds, as Linda explains. Well, it was James Kelvin Hamilton that came originally to uh, Oka River. They came from Ontario. When they arrived, they had um, six children and six dollars. That was in 1898. And they set up uh, a log house, which uh, was situated about, I don't know, what was the section on that? Do you 26, know? 26, 23, 17. 26, 23, 17. And um, they had four more children after they came here. So they had a total of 10 children, of which one of them is Richard's father. Charles Hamilton, and you'll see him in this picture here. The, um, then he's, Richard's dad moved to, um, along the Oka River, which has caused us a lot of problems with flooding, and still does. And uh, Richard and I set up a house beside them and we started farming along with them. The original home is still standing and is something very special to the family. During the bad times of the 30s, the original home was nearly lost forever. The original, um, the original homestead was lost at one time. It went uh, into receivership because we couldn't pay the bills. That would be in about the 1930s. And uh, Richard's dad came to the rescue and a couple of the sisters and bought it back from whoever, the bank or trust and the company. trust and loan company. So 
We're fortunate that it's still in the family because it, it had been lost at one time. Richard never met his grandfather, but he does recall being told about how difficult it was for the pioneer to get used to modernization. I always tell the story about when cars first came in. People like my grandfather had grown up with horses, doing everything with horses. And then the, the new cars came along and uh, some of these people were having difficulty uh, learning to drive a car because they were uh, older at the time. And uh, they tell the story that uh, my grandfather, of course, got this car and came home from town one day and got a little excited as he turned into the gate. And there was a gate there. To, of course, all farms had a gate. And he hollered, whoa, and the car didn't stop. <laughs> and he'd run right through the gate, and he was going around the yard, and uh, he didn't, he'd lost uh, his ability to think to how to stop this car. And somebody that happened to be in the yard uh, apparently jumped on the car and, and reached in and stopped it. But he was driving around the yard hollering, whoa, and hanging onto the steering wheel. So. Like any other farm, it takes a lot of hard work and cooperation to keep things running smoothly. Richard has always had his heart set on farming, and Linda agrees that farming is actually the best way of life. Their daughter is now a teacher and living off the farm, while their only son David works right alongside with his dad. Working with his son makes Richard proud. Yes, it's a good feeling to know that you're, you're, uh, the land and, and the operation that you've worked so hard to build up is hopefully going to be carried on and, and uh, perhaps built even more as, as that seems to be the trend that farms get bigger. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that philosophy. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, that's the total answer is getting bigger and bigger but in the past 10 or 15 years it has been the only way to survive really. But yes, to have uh, your your offspring come along and take up, pick up where you uh, leave off is, is a good feeling. It is still left to be seen whether or not the future generations will keep with the family business. The Hamiltons say that they hope the family farm is passed on so all their hard work pays off. Oh, that would be great, sure. Yeah. yeah. The, it's certainly not an easy business to run farms today. Like large farms are not, are, are not easy to run. They, uh, they take a lot of work and they take a lot of thinking and, and you have to be knowledgeable on marketing and uh, you have to be equally as knowledgeable on marketing as you do on growing the crops and uh, th th you have to keep up with the times and that, that's not, there's so much new stuff coming. You have to accept the new uh, ideas and progress, but on the other hand, everything that's new is not uh, progress either. Or not al it doesn't always pan out. As for the future of farming, the Hamiltons believe the sky's the limit. Richard says the modernization of machinery keeps getting better, so farming will always be changing, and it's up to the farmer to stay ahead of the times. Farmers are eternal optimists. Uh, if it seems as if you're a farmer today, you have to be a, a fairly optimistic of it and kind of dream about that big crop that's coming next year to make, replace the one that you didn't get this year. But uh, yeah, we, we, as I said, we, we think farming's been good to us, and we think that there definitely are opportunities there for future generations and there could be very good opportunities. Richard and Linda Hamilton, a farm family that have worked hard since the beginning to make sure things turn out for the future. Tonight, a 24-hour special report. What do you do?